Well, good morning, church. Merry Christmas. I got my red and green on. How about you guys? How are we doing? Are we ready? Are we ready for Christmas? Let me ask you. Did you decorate yet? Okay, come on. How about, how about our tree? Is our tree up? Okay, okay. Now let me ask you this. There's a couple people I was really impressed with the first service. Is there eggnog in your refrigerator? Anybody with nog? Whoa, hey now. Let's go. We've got a couple people. Keep, stay strong, Christmas people. Now, maybe the most important, at least in your kids' opinion, if you have young children, have you started your Christmas shopping yet? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I have to say I was never one for the whole Christmas shopping thing, going nuts with that. And I can still be turned off a little bit with all the commercialism and materialism that can take away from what Christmas truly is all about, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. However, when you become a parent, and I guess this holds true too to grandparents, aunt and uncles, anybody who has young children to buy for, Christmas shopping becomes fun again. And there's nothing like finding that home run Christmas gift. It takes, it takes a bit of work, it takes a bit of thought, but, but when you find that home run Christmas gift and just get to watch the, the priceless reaction on your kids' faces, it's really special. And last Christmas was one of those times. It was one of those years for Aaron and I, we really hit it out of the park with our boys' Christmas gift. That instead of buying a, a toy or a video game or, you know, some other tchotchke that our kids would get tired of in a week or two, we decided that we wanted to do something that we would be able to enjoy together as a family. And so we booked a surprise family vacation to Jamaica. And it was awesome. I got to be honest, I love you guys, love being with you right here. I kind of wish I was in Jamaica right now. But what we did was we wrapped up a Jamaica coffee mug, and we put it under the tree. And, and that's what they opened up on Christmas morning, and there was a, a note attached to it, and we got the entire thing on video. Go ahead and, and take a look. Make sure the, the right, volume's up. Why don't you guys open this together? Read it. We are the... No, no, wait. Oh, read the front of it. We are going into January 13th. Jamaica? Jamaica? Mm -hmm. Really? Really. We're going to Jamaica. Jamaica? Daddy's going to show you the video of the place we're going. Yeah. That's vacation. That's like the best gift. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we're going to Jamaica. There was more dancing, but they made me cut the clip short, okay? I, I, they're at the age now, I have to ask their permission now to show clips, so. But, but it, it, was, it was special, it really was. And even though it is easy to get carried away with buying presents around the holidays, the purpose behind the tradition of giving gifts at Christmas time is to celebrate and to remember the greatest gift of all time, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That it is at Christmas where we encounter the love, the kindness, and generosity of our God in all of its glory. That, that just like when you, you open up that, that amazing, that home run Christmas gift on, on Christmas morning and you see the, just the surprise, the wonder on, on children's faces, that we would have the same awe of the notion of the presence of God, that God has come down and has come to be, what, be with us, that God in the flesh walking amongst us, that that is the true message and is the gift of Christmas. And so this is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and is our focus for our Christmas series this year, The Gift of Faith. That over the next three weeks, we're going to read through part of the Christmas story and look at the impact of how God's gift of faith has the power not only to transform our lives as individuals, but also to redeem and restore the entire world from the plague that is sin. So this morning, we will be looking at the gift of faith in the life of Mary, the mother of God. And so please go ahead and open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. But before we get started, there are three points that we are going to explore together in our passage this morning. That number one, the gift of faith begins with humility. Number two, the gift of faith can only be received by the grace of God. And then finally, number three, the gift of faith is miraculous. So let's go ahead and begin studying our passage together by looking at our first point in our text. The gift of faith begins with humility. And we'll get started by reading verses 26 through 29. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The moment had finally come for which all of redemptive history had been pointing to and waiting for. The Messiah finally arrived. The angel Gabriel had been sent by God to this small agricultural village in the region of Galilee named Nazareth to a young teenage girl, which we read in verse 27, the virgin's name was Mary. And so Gabriel appears before Mary with a message from God and begins to greet her by saying in verse 28, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now at first glance, Mary's response to Gabriel seems like the typical reaction of those we find in the scriptures after being confronted by such an awesome majestic, angelic being like Gabriel. We read in verse 29 that she was greatly troubled. But the Greek word used here is diatoroso, meaning to be disturbed, but also it means to be perplexed. So when we take a closer look here at verse 29, what we find is, is that it wasn't so much the appearance of the angel Gabriel that deeply troubled Mary, although I'm sure his appearance was extremely intimidating and anxiety-inducing. But rather, what Mary finds so deeply troubling and greatly perplexing is what the angel Gabriel had communicated to her in his greeting. And we read in verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. So what part of Gabriel's greeting is, is it that has put Mary in such a state of distress? I mean, after all, he even hasn't, got, he hasn't gotten yet to, to, the, to his message that he's come to share. All he's done is say hello. But sometimes that's all it takes, right? And what we have here is the original, you had me at hello. You see, when Gabriel appears before Mary and begins to deliver this message given to him from God, he starts by saying in verse 28, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And so the reason why Mary is so perplexed that she's in a state of distress is that it's 
the incredible notion that the God of the universe that has spoken creation into existence, that the word of God says that the oceans can fit in the hollow of his hand, that this almighty God has acknowledged her that the name above all names knows her name. That she has just learned from Gabriel that not only has the Lord recognized her, but that she is favored by God. That the very presence of God is with her. You had me at hello. And this is such a beautiful and precious moment where the humility of the mother of God is on display for all of us to see that Mary is so captivated by God's presence that she can't help but be awestruck and say in her heart, who am I? Who am I that God himself would consider and acknowledge me? It is her humility that the Lord finds so beautiful, so attractive, and what makes Mary truly blessed among women. What we find is that the gift of faith begins with humility. We read in James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And there's so much here that reveals the character and the heart of our God, the things that he values, what it is that he looks for in his people and the nature of his kingdom. What we find is, is that God doesn't choose a great city like Rome or Athens or Jerusalem for the virgin conception of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Savior of the world. That Instead, for the most important moment, and the history of the universe for this one-time momentous event that is unique in every way and can never be duplicated. The setting is to be the poor, insignificant, no-name town of Nazareth. A little Galilean town that is never even mentioned in the Old Testament. And the womb that will carry the greatest treasure the world has ever known. It's not of a princess, a prophetess, or someone of some other great worldly importance. It's that of a young farm girl, a teenager from a family of little means, a person who in the world's eyes is both unimportant and irrelevant, a young virgin who is, who is pledged to be married to the village carpenter. We read in 1 Corinthians 1.27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Isn't that the truth? And so we must ask ourselves, are we in awe of the fact that God has come and pursued us? That God knows each and every one of your names. That the word of God says that God knows every single hair on your head. That God has come and pursued each and every one of us while we were still sinners. While we were at our very worst. To have a personal relationship with each of us. Have we been given eyes to see? The way God sees, the way our humble servant King Jesus sees the world. Are we spellbound by the fact that God has given us favor through his son, Jesus Christ, and has offered to us salvation, eternal life? What we find here is that at the very beginning of the incarnation, King Jesus, he's already advancing and establishing his kingdom. As we've talked about and spent a great deal of time studying together in God's word this past year, God's kingdom is a upside-down kingdom. 
I hope you're, I hope you're getting tired of me saying that because that means you know it. You're catching on. See, Jesus calls us away from the fallen kingdoms of this world that are void of humility and saturated by pride. What we find is, is that Jesus, he's a different kind of king who does not leverage his power for personal gain, but instead does the very opposite of humbling himself to serve others, whether it be ministering to the poor, being a friend to the friendless, caring for the sick, or even voluntarily laying down his very life as a substitutionary atoning sacrifice to those. He comes to save those who would have him crucified. He comes to save and to love those who are impossible to love in their sin. And yet Jesus chooses to come and pursue us and lay his life down for us in order to offer us eternal life. That this is the good news of the kingdom of God. This is the good news of the gospel. And you know, we are living in a time in our world, in our society, where, where our, our leaders, right, they, they couldn't be more opposite than Jesus, right? Our leaders who view humility as being a weakness, that our, 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 our leaders could never just own up and just say, yeah, I made a mistake. I, what I said was wrong. Yeah, I was wrong about that. That, that, that our leaders look at, at humility as being a, a weakness. They, need to, that they feel that they need to instead project strength in order to build their own brand, persona, and celebrity. Where here is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he lays his life down for us. That Jesus is our great servant king who comes and washes his disciples' feet. Right? Jesus calls us to the opposite. Jesus calls us to humility. Thereby leading us away from the kingdom of self and towards his kingdom of righteousness. The kingdom of heaven. That Jesus calls us to pick up our cross and follow after him. That that is the calling on our lives if we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ. That we would die to self so that the world would be born again. That we would be born again and that the world would be born again. Be made new and restored. That that is what Jesus is doing. That's what his kingdom is all about. And it is a work of faith which begins with humility. Which is why the Lord tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so know that this morning. That no matter what's going on in your life, whatever narrative it is that, that people have crafted for you or you've crafted for yourself, God has called you to be used by him to advance his kingdom. You have a calling on your life from the high king of heaven that you have been favored by God. You know, in every way we see that Mary models this kind of humility that God treasures. And even though God has placed the most sacred calling upon her life to be the mother of Jesus, she has bowed her heart to the Lord in humility and comes to the understanding that her son Jesus is also her Lord and Savior. It's pretty amazing, right? That like John the Baptist says of Jesus, who at this time was miraculously in the womb of Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. And we're going to get to that. Gabriel actually gets that a, a couple of verses later. But John the Baptist says of Jesus in John 127, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandal. That is the humble posture we are to have before the Lord. And so the gift of faith begins with humility, but then it proceeds towards the need for God's saving grace. That we aren't to just humble ourselves and, you know, here's the calling on your life, good luck. No. That God extends to us his favor, his saving grace and power in our lives. And so this brings us to the second point in our passage this morning. The gift of faith can only be received by the grace of God. And so let's move ahead and read verses 30 through 33 together. It says, And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, 
for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So after acknowledging Mary's humility, the Lord, through his messenger, Gabriel, delivers the good news that that Mary has found favor with God. That God has not come to her empty-handed, but full of grace. We read in verse 30, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And that word that is translated in English here as favor is the Greek, Greek word charis, which many of you may know, which also happens to be the Greek word for grace. And in the Vulgate, the Latin translation, which was written by Jerome, that is used by Roman Catholics, this is translated as gratia plena, which means full of grace. And so for those of us who may have grown up Roman Catholic, we are very familiar with this phrase because it's part of the beginning of the Hail Mary prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace. Now, unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church has misappropriated this teaching by attributing to to Mary the, the characteristic of being born sinless, right? And unfortunately for some, this has even kind of confused them to the place where, where, where people start to, to exalt her to the place where they functionally kind of worship her. And of course we find no such teaching anywhere in the Bible, as this is sadly a man-made doctrine that comes from Pope Pius XI in 1854, the Immaculate Conception. As the mother of Jesus, Mary is to be esteemed. She is to be greatly admired. She is to be revered and, and respected. However, Scripture is very clear that these such attributes belong to God and God alone, that the Lord alone is worthy to be worshipped. In verses 31 through 33, Gabriel informs Mary of the extraordinary calling that God has placed upon her life, that she will conceive in her womb and give birth to the Son of God. However, remarkably enough, even though she has been chosen to be the mother of God, Mary still finds herself in the same position as the rest of us. That she was born a sinner and is in need of a Savior. So, just like Mary, she's a sinner in need of a Savior, and she is in need of grace. However, just like Mary, we have been favored by God. We read in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so what we find here is that the Christmas story is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies and promises that have all come true with the arrival and conception of God's Son, Jesus. That his very name is what causes a weary world to rejoice. That even though we are plagued by sin, we are full of grace. That God, by his grace, has offered salvation to us as a, as a gift freely to be received. Right, the name Jesus, what does it mean? It means Yahweh saves. Matthew's gospel tells us his name is Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And so despite our wickedness, sin, and rebellion that has marred God's creation and, and, and brought nothing but pain, brokenness, despair, and death into the world, God's love never wavers. Our God has come to show us favor. We read in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows us his grace by sending his son Jesus to be the substitutionary, atoning sacrifice for our sin. That Jesus lived the perfect life that we could never live. And he died the death that we all deserved because of our sin. That he died that death in our place so that he could offer us the gift of eternal life. And it's all by his grace. There's nothing we could do to earn that gift. It is a gift that is to be freely received, that God did it all. God came and pursued us. 
God is the one who came and he went to the cross on our behalf. It is, salvation is a work of God, 100%. See, grace is unmerited favor before God. It's, it's something that you don't deserve. And with the arrival of Jesus, he extends to us that grace. And God's presence comes to be among us, that God is with us, and we are full of grace. And see, this is the good news of Christmas. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we have been offered the gift of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. That Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this now brings us to our third and final point this morning. The gift of faith is miraculous. So let's go ahead and finish reading our passage this morning by reading Luke 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 34 through 38 together. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And so Mary receives the word of the Lord from the angel Gabriel, and naturally she is just dumbfounded by it. The message she receives is absolutely astonishing on so many levels, but the most obvious being biological. Mary asks the question, how is it possible for me to conceive a child while still being a virgin? So we read in verse 35, And the angel answered Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So what we are confronted with here is the truth and the good news, the miraculous virgin birth of Christ, that the virgin birth is essential to our faith. And I cannot emphasize that enough. There are certain things that we come across in Christianity where it's like, it, it could be this, or it could be that. There, there are a few different options that it could be. Maybe it's a little fuzzy, a little gray. The virgin birth is, is not one of those things, okay? It is black and white, is essential to our faith. Without the virgin birth, the gospel falls apart. Our faith falls apart. So the virgin birth is essential to our faith because in order to have a sacrifice which is sufficient to remove God's wrath, the sacrifice must be of the same nature that is of ourselves. So the Apostle Paul explains it this way in Romans 5, 17. He says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, speaking of Adam, who we've all inherited our sin nature from, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so the sacrifice must come from a man, just like sin came through one man. However, not just any man would do. Because a sinful man, like any of us, any, any person who's ever been walked this earth, right, is a sinner. And, and, and so that, that exchange is only a one-for-one one exchange, a sinful person for another sinful person. So what is required here is a sacrifice that must be worth such immense value that it could satisfy the wrath of God and cover the sins of the entire world. And so where could such a man be found? Well, only a perfect sacrifice would do. And the virgin birth is what makes this possible. Because what it does is it enables Jesus to be 100% man and 100% God at the same time. Because Jesus is born of God, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
making him sinless. And at the same time, he takes on human flesh. He's born of Mary. And so again, he's 100% man, and he's 100% God. And this is the miraculous nature of the virgin birth that makes the gift of faith possible, offering salvation to all those who trust in Jesus Christ as, as their Lord and Savior. And again, it's, it's miraculous. Now I know there are some of you here this morning that you get a little funny, you get a little weird when we start talking about miracles. However, miracles are vital to our faith and our identity in Jesus Christ. Simply put, you cannot be a Christian if you do not believe in miracles. And here's why I say that. When, when we come to this passage that records the, vir the virgin conception of Christ, in many ways, it mirrors the process of our salvation that is in the same way absolutely miraculous. We read here in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, essentially, when you break this down and you think about it, the same thing happens to us when we receive the gift of salvation in Christ. The Holy Spirit comes upon us and takes residence within us, that we are dead in our sins. And what happens is an exchange takes place, that God exchanges right, our, our heart of stone, our heart of sin, with a heart of flesh, that the Spirit of God comes to dwell within us. So the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we become a new creation in Christ where the Lord overshadows us, that God now lives within us. We are covered in the righteousness of Christ, and we are born again. And what happens when we are born again is now we become adopted into the family of God as a child of the high king of heaven. That a, a new child is born. A son or a daughter of the high king of heaven. We become part of the family of God. We read in 1 John 3.1, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are. Is that not miraculous? That in every way, our salvation is, mirac is a miracle. That if we were to go around this room one by one and began to share the stories of transformation that have taken place in our lives, we would see that there is no explanation except for the miraculous grace and power of God. That there's no way that, that you have to understand who I was before Christ, what it is that God saved me from, and now who I am today. There is no human explanation for it except for the power of God, that I am a new creation in Christ. That, that, that there, we look at one another and say, you, you didn't know me before I didn't know God. That there's such a stark change, transformation that has taken place. That the only explanation is the miraculous power and, and grace of God. So what other explanation is there? Again, you go from being dead in your sin to being alive in Christ. And so, is it not accurate to say that at this very moment, we are in a room full of living, breathing, walking, and talking miracles? It's the truth. This is the miracle. This is the power. This is the gift of faith. This is the gift of Christmas. This is what Christmas is all about. And so whether it be pointing to how God has miraculously worked through redemptive history, which is recorded in his word, the Bible, or in the tangible, ex tangible examples we can point to in our own lives of God's miraculous power, the reality is, is that the gift of faith is in every way miraculous. Essentially, this is what Gabriel's doing here. He points to the scriptures first as Jesus being the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant in verses 32 and 33. And then he gives a tangible example in Mary's own life. At her cousin Elizabeth. 
Right? Who earlier we read in, in Luke how, how miraculously Elizabeth conceives of John the Baptist, even though she was barren and advanced and aged. We read in verses 36 and 37, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month which with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. This is what God does. He transforms. He restores. He makes all things new. So let me do my best Al Michaels impression now and ask you, do you believe in miracles? When was the last time you considered the things of God in your life, your salvation story, or maybe you haven't come yet to faith in Christ and you have a loved one, you've seen the, the transformation in their life. And you said, this is a miracle in my midst. When was the last time you considered the many facets of the gospel that are a part of your salvation and said, this is, this is a miracle in my presence? When was the last time you marveled at the miraculous nature of the gift of faith in your life? And so this Christmas season, may we all marvel at the miraculous gift of faith that God has provided for us through his son Jesus. Let us be in awe of the miracle of becoming one with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Let us wonder at the hope that we, we get to look forward to with, with hope. The day when Jesus comes again. When he will right every wrong. That he will eliminate all sin, pain, sickness, and death. No more corona. No more masks. So that we will dwell with God for eternity in his presence. We have hope. That's what we're looking forward to. That this is not all there is. Better not be. This is the promise. This is the hope we have in Christ. This is the gift of faith in Christmas. And so let we, may we treasure the gift of faith in Christ that we can be declared righteous before God and enter into a personal relationship with him. May we come and adore our Savior and his miraculous work in our lives that all begins at Christmas. And so our passage finally comes to a close with Mary, by God's grace, miraculously trusting in the Lord and by faith receiving God's calling upon her life. We read in verse 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May it be our collective prayer as a church family for the gift of faith. The gift of faith to be at the forefront of our lives. That like Mary, we would treasure God's presence in our lives, be amazed by his grace, and be compelled to follow after the Lord, reflecting his love to others as his faithful servant. But the, the gift of faith is like any other gift in the sense that even though it has been offered to us, we do not take ownership of it unless we take that step to receive it. Right? This is, this is gift giving and 101. Right? You, you don't have the gift unless you receive the gift. And so this morning as we prepare to gather around the communion table together as a church family, I want to give you the opportunity to do just that. That at this time, I would like to ask those who are assisting with the Lord's Supper to begin distributing the communion elements. But, but as, as they are doing that, let me ask you, have you received God's free gift of salvation by taking that step, by Humbly, humbly coming before the Lord, admitting, God, I am a sinner. I am in need of a Savior. And that you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Have you taken that step? The Lord Jesus has pursued us and loved us while we were still sinners. At our very worst, he comes to us, walks amongst us in the flesh, and offers us the free gift of eternal life to enter into his kingdom. But first, we must pledge allegiance to our King, Jesus, by humbly 
submitting to God. So again, I invite you to call out to the Lord now to put the gift of faith into action and tell him, like Mary, take my life, Lord, and let it be according to your word. When we partake partake of the Lord's Supper as the family of God, it's a time when we remember that our life is not our own, that we were bought with the precious blood of Christ who lived that perfect life that we could never live, that made that sacrifice on our behalf that we deserve to free us from the bondage of sin, that it was Jesus' broken body and shed blood that ransomed us from sin and has enabled us to be born again, transformed into a new creation by the power of the Holy Spirit, that when we trust in Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, we now belong to God and give thanks for his presence in our lives. And so now we gather around the communion table together as the family of God proclaiming the Lord's victory over sin and death and we anticipate his glorious return when we will be reunited with our conquering king in all of his glory, feasting with him and his kingdom for all of eternity. Mm. However, this is only possible if we have trusted in Jesus to be our king and have been born again through his spirit by grace through faith in him alone.